uh, welcome to the second lecture or the second session of our class, uh, Electronics and Microprocessors. Today we will cover and complete the theoretical and fundamental stuff, which is Internet of Things, as well as embedded systems. Okay, so let's carry on now with the lecture. So last week we talked about fundamentals. We, we discussed these topics, electrical and electronic systems. We talked about CPU versus microprocessor. Uh, we talked about, uh, oops, what happened? Yeah, hardware abstractions, computer program versus algorithm, syntax, online resources. And we covered all of this material. By the way, uh, somebody asked me this question. Uh, Sir, the assignment, can I add more than was inside these slides? By all means, you should actually add more. The more you add, the better. It doesn't mean that you go to Wikipedia and copy the whole volume there. No, uh, you have to be selective. Read online by all means and then extract the, the good stuff. So I don't, don't, uh, don't think that by giving me volume you, that you're going to get score. No. It's all about the quality of your answer, not the quantity. Okay, so uh, yeah, so these are, and also some of these slides are written in very short form, so you might want to elaborate more with examples, maybe even case studies. So that was the first part, which is fundamentals, and this covers assignment number one. Now let's talk about chapter two, which is, uh, sorry, we did actually start chapter two about IoT, but we didn't finish it. We talked about, we reviewed the principal elements of the regular internet and how it works. And then we use that understanding to talk about the IoT and its own principal elements. We explained that an IoT framework essentially contains or it's made of a thing, which is the key word come from, which is a device that broadcasts information. And then that, that information goes to the cloud where it's processed and is viewed. And uh, uh, um, hold on, guys. Okay, sorry. So now, uh, basically, after the, the 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 device or the thing broadcasts the information to the cloud, it will then be will be stored in databases or storage places where it can be saved for later use, and then uh, then it will be. Uh, Processed for later. Then this data, which is in raw form, will be processed further using a specific data analytics algorithm. Then it becomes processed information. This processed information is then well be. Uh, this is where the target, what we really want to see. Uh, So this way I can write on my slides and scribble over. Okay, so this is me. Uh... So yeah, so this is basically where uh, some of the work that a lot of the information coming from IoT is this where really the big bucks of IoT because of the processed information. And then also later on when we work with IoT, we will also going to develop or use our own IoT client as well. Okay, so now we talked about the three main principal elements of the IoT framework. We a device that is capturing or gathering raw data. This could be as simple as a sensor that is connected to the internet. Uh, basically, this could be simply a simple sensor plus a network card. That's why sometimes we call it a network sensor. Or it could be an EMS system that involves a mechanical system like a robot or something like that that uses information as well. And then the second element of the IoT framework is the algorithm itself. That's why you hear this point a lot in the last, in, in recent years, data analytics, big data, or whatever, right? So this, what's going on here is that what happens to this information? What do we do with it? And this actually could be a lot. 
This could be AI, this could be image processing, this could be robotics algorithm, it could be whatever really you want, whatever the project actually needs to be. And then finally, uh, this information, this information you see here, it's in a, in a cloud, right? So what are, how do you see it? So that's why you need a client. Could be an application, an Android app, or an iPhone app, or something like that, that you need to use and interact with in order to see the above information. So think about it this way. Like first, you need a device that gets you the data, then process the data, and then work with the data. And these are the principal elements of the IoT framework. Uh, I think, uh, oh yeah, this was mentioned at the very end of the lecture, so let's talk about this right now. So when it comes to the IoT framework, there's usually, uh, like we said, right, we have, first of all, the device, right? Then we have the cloud, and then we have the client. Is that right? And this is you watching the situation. So remote monitoring basically means that this is actually the situation. Uh, the information goes in this general direction. The device gets you the information, sends it to, to you. So you are only watching, but you're not doing anything else. Now, when it comes to uh, remote monitoring, it will be essentially the opposite. So remote monitoring will be the other way around. You will be using the same client here, using some sort of the buttons or some slide or click or whatever, or keyboard button or something like that, some way to interact and basically give commands and the reverse will actually happen. So that would be remote controlling. And then finally, sometimes you, in the third type of, of IoT device, you can actually have a thing to thing. So maybe you could have another device here next to it and this other device would also send information, would also send to the same guy. So basically he's watching multiple devices, but it's not just uh, he is watching multiple devices, but also it's possible that those devices are talking to each other as well. They were basically exchanging information by themselves independently of you. You can watch the process, you can watch them inter interacting with each other and sharing information, but not necessarily uh, you cannot, uh, you can stop them from working with each other, but then uh, you can see that this interaction might actually help them and improve their work. Or it could be any combination of all of these types. It could be both monitoring and controlling. It could be monitoring and controlling multiple devices and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is an example of an IoT framework. This is a real project that we developed um, and, and completed um, late last year in um, November 2019, and we developed a robotic camera. I will show you more examples and actual examples of this device later on. So we developed a robotic camera dolly or a robotic camera. Uh, a dolly is just uh, the trolley that moves the camera. It's called a dolly, number one. So we developed this device right here. That it's essentially a robotic uh, platform that moves the camera. So the guy on his laptop could be in the same room, could be in the same building, could be in a different building, could be in a different country altogether, as long as it's connected to the internet. So from his laptop, he will then control the camera, and at the same time, the camera will be sending footage live or near live with a little bit of delay to him, and then based on the footage that he's watching, he will then control. So this is an example of uh, remote uh, controlling and monitoring. Um, and by the way, in our particular example or project, we have another camera. So, and we are doing the same thing to both simultaneously. So they are actually multiple devices, but uh, they do not talk to each other. So there is no interaction between these two. Okay, so moving on. So uh, I'm not sure why the slide is repeated, but let's move on. And we talked about the potential of IoT, but I think we sort of stopped here, or we sort of reached towards the end of the lecture and people got tired around here. So the potential of IoT, um, I think we started by talking about the potential. This is where we reached towards the end of the class. And I gave you the example of the vending machine as the example of how we can actually streamline. And streamlining the process essentially is all about efficiency and reducing costs, which in turn can be translated into increasing profits. And this is the number one reason why anyone would come to IoT. And essentially, uh, because of this, you can come to any company in the world, any industry, any field, and any design, 
and you come and tell them that I have something that could reduce your cost, improve your productivity, and increase your profit. They will definitely be interested. And this is the, the first uh, benefit of IoT. But more and more in recent years, people start to realize, and we talked about this last week, so I'm not going to dwell again. You can watch the video of the last week. An example of this is about the vending, or what a vending machine. Oh, excuse me, the, the, the vending machine, which is the juice or etc. Now, we didn't have time to talk much about this, but uh, we can do that today, which is combining data with other technologies. Um, I'll give you a real life example on this one in, in the next couple of slides, and of course, I'll give you another example on this as well. Uh, I, I think last lecture, I used the vending machine as an example of all of these potentials. Uh, this time around, I will use different industries. So once again, the three principal benefits of IoT is obviously number one is process streamlining. This is the number one and most widely used application of IoT. Number two is integration with other technologies. Like, for example, you want, uh, yeah, here's an example of integration with other technologies because we use IoT data to control the robots. So this is basically IoT slash robotics. You get what I mean? So right here is an example of what, how IoT data can help another technology altogether. You can also link IoT through uh, another real powerful example is blockchain. And this is coming up in the next couple of slides. And then of course, the example of monetizing the data. So uh, yeah, this is an example of, and this is more on process streamlining. And we talked about this example a lot already which is how IoT can help the company running the vending machine to reduce the number of times that it would need to refill its machine without, with minimum number of, of trips, minimum number of costs, and therefore saving a lot of money. So this is basically, if we say that is say, if you have a lot of machines spread out uh, in many, many locations, and imagine then you don't have to actually travel into all of these machine locations instead, the machines will tell you exactly which station or which uh, location is the one that needs it. So imagine that you will have the ability, you're watching on the internet or on your, on your browser, imagine suddenly a red light pops up here and a red light pops up here, and then you realize, okay, only these three locations need reloading, so you only go to these three locations, then go home and minimizing the cost. So this all of your operations are running smoothly without having you having to worry about costs. So this example, I'm going to quickly skip because I already explained it in detail in the last section. So I'm going to move on to agriculture sensors. By the way, I also have another project on this one. We recently published a paper and also uh, registered a patent on IoT. The concept of IoT and agriculture sensors is not new, but the way we did it, is new, and uh, I will show you later examples of that. So why do we need IoT in, in, in agriculture? Once again, imagine that you have a big and large um, agriculture field. So I'm going to give you an example of that in, in right now. So agriculture, culture, field. And uh, the same situation that have in, uh, in what the vending machine could also happen in, in a field. So imagine that, oh, you know what, let's do a different plant. So agriculture field, let's say palm or, or palm. Yeah, um, yeah, it's palm tree. Okay, this is a lovely uh, visualization of the field. Um, yeah, this one is perfect. In fact, probably this one is perfect. No, not this one. Let's go back. Okay, let's just take a look at this one. And uh, where did it go? I should have clicked on it. So, open image, you know, the connect view image. Um, copy link and rest. Copy here. And let's take a look at this. Okay, that doesn't work. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, this one right here. So, Okay, so let's say I have this field, or you are designed or required to operate in this field. And you can see how vast or how large is this tree is, or this field is. 
let's just assume that you only have 100 trees, 100 palm trees. And those palm trees are spread out, as you can see here. Or maybe they are actually creating a grid, like you see here, for example, in this particular picture, or maybe in this picture. This is the top view. Let's say we're watching from a drone. Yeah, this is another example of a drone image. Actually, this is the best one right here. So let's say, okay, this works now. So let's say you are actually having this field and we have a lot more trees than this. And you are the field manager. How then would you know which tree is, is uh, ready for picking? Or which tree needs water? Which tree needs um, fertilizer? Or which tree needs medicine against diseases or something like that? Or which tree is suffering from over over watering? Let's say the fluid or the soil is a little bit too much uh, watery, something like that. You have no idea of knowing this information unless you go in person and travel from one tree to the other. And unfortunately, this is going to become a very, very time consuming and very, very tedious job. And once again, we have a similar situation to the water vending machine. You have to go three by three, one by one, and expect one by one. You'll be wasting a lot of time and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, resources only uh, when you realize that, only to realize that uh, maybe uh, you're wasting a lot of time. Imagine that the trees. Just like the vending machine can talk to you, imagine that every one of these trees can actually send you information, send you the status about their situation. Maybe not that individual tree, maybe it's a little bit of a long shot. Maybe you have a region, or maybe you have, you have broken down your field into zones. And every one of these zones, right, has essentially, uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at this picture right here. I'm gonna, Copy this image. Yeah. And then I'm going to oh, no, open it here. Oops. Where did it go? Was it good? Yeah. Okay. So now let's say this is the field right? And rather than having the whole field, imagine that you break it down into zones. So you have one zone here. And uh, I know the zone is not necessarily a square, but Bear with me for a second. And you have one zone here and one zone, one zone, and so on, right? And you break down your field into zones, right? And every one of these zones uh, has uh, an email. I know this sounds funny, but uh, bear with me for a second. Uh, every one of these zones can send you information. They actually have a connection with you. Uh, they can send you the status of the zone rather than of the individual tree. They can send you information like the temperature of the soil, the water level, the, the medicine or the fertilizer status, and so on and so forth. So this way, rather than traveling the whole field and suffering, then at the very least, your work is slightly uh, reduced. So this way now, you will have to focus your effort only on each zone. Now, I'm drawing square shapes, but the reality in agriculture, they are not really squares, but they are actually broken down into zones. So then, you, what we're going to do is that we're going to actually install sensors that are going to be on the ground, in the soil itself. And those sensors will send us information about the status of the soil. And then based on the data that we receive from the sensor, we can then generate a, a, a map of the field. And then we're going to know what the situation is happening, what's going on with each field. So, for example, uh, rather than basically going blindly on each, where did that picture go? Going blindly on each figure uh, or each part of the field and hoping and guessing, but now, now based on the data coming from the sensors, we actually know where everything is needed. You will know which part of the field needs more water. You will know which part of the field needs more fertilizers, which part of the field is ready for picking, and so on and so forth. And this way, you can focus your resources, your manpower, and your raw material, and not raw material, maybe uh, fertilizers, right? Uh, or your consumables, wherever they are needed. This is another very powerful example of IoT agriculture, or IoT for agriculture. And I'm sure everyone has heard about industrial I I IoT, which is IIoT, 
Uh, now, so I'm sure everyone has heard about this, which is the uh, Industrial Revolution before. Well, the, the building block for this is IIoT, which is Industrial IoT, which is essentially a fancy word for saying IoT for factories or for the industry. And this is works by integrating the principles of IoT or the IoT framework that we've seen here, but rather than integrating it with, uh, say, your house, we integrate it with the factory. So this way, we can take robotic systems, and automated systems, uh, production lines, machines, design systems, et cetera, et cetera, and they will all be linked, excuse me, all be linked to the net, and then everyone involved, let's say the factory managers, the contractors, the suppliers, and even the customers can then have a full information about what's going on, you know, what's the status of the so, so once again, the IoT is not just for fun, also it's sure that, like for example, um, let's say Proton, right, or any other car company, they don't build everything in-house. They will hire contractors to build some of their assembly components. They will hire another company to build the door, for example. So they can monitor, rather than wait for the other company or the contractor to give them a status, they will then simply uh, monitor the status in real time. And therefore, they can plan their own production according to their supplier status. So this is just a small example of how IoT for industry can work wonder. Let's change to, yeah. So that's how the, this actually can be really, really powerful. Now, I'm not sure, some of the, this is a year three course, but later on when you work, uh, when you come to the year four, some of you will take the course Production Planning and Control, or PPC. Then you will see how powerful IoT can become. Because a lot of the problems with Production Planning Control, or PPC, it's all about managing the relationship between the company as well as its suppliers. Imagine that you are a company, that you are, let's say you are a car company, let's say Proton, right? And you want to build the car and you have everything ready, but unfortunately, one of your contractors is delayed, then you are also going to be delayed. You have nothing to do except waiting for that contractor to finish their work. That will affect your relationship with your own customers and delay you further and probably cost you money. Even though it's not your fault, it's the contractor's fault, but still going to be a problem. Imagine if you have a direct line between you and their production line directly. So therefore, you can see if they can slow down, and therefore, you can also slow down accordingly, rather than wait for them to tell you the news after the fact. So that's why uh, being linked through IoT with your customers and clients as well, it's a very, very powerful tool for PPC as well, for production planning and control. So any questions about streamlining and how it's powerful, or what do you mean by process streamlining? Any question about this uh, this part right here? Um, about what do you mean by process streamlining and how does IoT help? Any questions about that? Hopefully at the end of this part or at the end of this section right now, you should be able to answer this question as to how does IoT help in process streamlining? And also you should be able to provide a few examples. I would recommend strongly so your voice is fading in and out, and it's quite hard to comprehend. I don't know what to do. How about now? Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you better. Is this better, guys? It's amazing, because right now I'm not using the microphone. I'm using the, the laptop directly without any microphone. So the microphone was the guilty party. Okay then, let's carry on. Well, uh, one hour off, so I guess we can stop for now. That's where I take a small break. It's already four o'clock. Uh, we can talk, stop with, we can take a small break for about five minutes, and then we're gonna come back to continue with the next topic, which is integration. So let's go for a small break. <laughs> After we finally solve the voice problem, and then we can uh, continue after the session. So I'm going to pause for a second for about five minutes, and then I'll see you after the break.
Okay, welcome back to the class. Let's go ahead. Uh, before we go any further, can you guys hear me? Is my voice clear? Yes, sir. Can hear you. Okay. All right. Uh, if anyone's still having voice issues or can I hear me properly, uh, do let me know. Anyway, so let's continue with our discussion. So, uh, integration. So, we talked about process streamlining for the IoT in a previous slide, and now we talk about integration, which is combining IoT, not really combining IoT, but combining IoT data. That's the key word here. My laptop, oh, not now. Okay. Combine IoT with other emerging technologies. So what does that mean it means is that okay, if you if you go back to our uh, earlier diagram about the IoT framework that we see here, and we say that that after you have processed the data, then the data will then be sent to the client for us to watch. Well, apart from just doing that, we could also take the process data and then send it to somewhere else. We can send it to a robot. We can send it to blockchain units and so on and so forth. We can actually use it for multiple other applications other than being used or viewed by us. And this is actually, is becoming more and more the power, the real power of IoT, which is what can you do with the data? Some industries, um, depend actually on the data coming from other. For example, blockchain. I want to give you a real example right now with how blockchain really can uh, affect, uh, or sorry, the combination of blockchain plus IoT. The earlier I mentioned an example of um, the agricultural field using IoT and how we can take uh, data coming from IoT and then create a grid or create a map of the farm. Well, actually, this is not all that the, the IoT data can do for us. Another thing we can learn from this IoT data from here is how much of this field is ready for, for picking, and therefore how much ready for harvesting, and therefore how much is ready for selling. So we have this information in real time, not in a prediction, not in six months later. We can predict, not only predict, we can know exactly how much is ready for harvesting today. So I can take this information, I can, I can actually send it right now to my customers in real time. So then uh, I'm sure maybe not everybody is familiar with this blockchain, but uh, I don't want to go into details, but it's safe to say that it's uh, the technology behind cryptocurrency. And it also allows you to do what is called virtual contracts. Essentially, it is related to money and uh, the use of virtual contracts and, and so on and so forth. And the idea behind this is that the contract itself can become like a program. See, in an industry or in an, an agriculture business, right, the contract between harvesters and the, and the customers depends on the availability of the product, depends on the season, depends on the time of the year, depends on other factors. So these factors are dynamic and changing in real time. So therefore, the price of the produce can also change in real time. So rather than waiting for things to happen and then come up with a contract manually between two people, you can create a blockchain algorithm that will actually monitor this information in real time and then create a contract in real time to, def do, to have the price of the produce. In other words, that I can actually come here and apart from monitoring the field in real time, I can also create a blockchain uh, virtual contract. Uh, and then this virtual contract, contract virtual contract, virtual contract then will take information take info from the sensors in real time. This info then would then allow the contract, this information then from the sensors, after we take the information, then what's the point of having a virtual contract? Why do we have to, apart from being fancy, whatever. 
the real advantage of having a virtual contract is that you can lock in your profit. See, if you are an agriculture field without blockchain, the produce or the product will remain in the field. And if you don't sell it immediately, or at least if you don't have a contract for it, then it might not be sold and it will stay in your field. It might rot, it might become old, it might lose value. So therefore, if you have information in real time, then if you and the, and the client knows exactly when they're going to get it and how much they're going to get it, then that actually becomes very, very easy, useful for them. And therefore, they can actually invest in a virtual contract through blockchain. That's one of the examples of blockchain and how it can happen. But once again, the blockchain contract will never happen if it doesn't have information coming directly from the center of the IoT. This is a real-life example where you have a sensor data, like a technological sensor data that will directly affect money. You know I mean? So this is a real example between uh, this. So the way that this would have happened is between, first of all, IoT, then blockchain, and then business. This is one of the reasons why blockchain is coming a real boom in recent years, last year especially, or the year before that. It was, it was and it is still, uh, maybe because of COVID-19, things have slowed down a little bit, but still ongoing greatly. So this is an example of how IoT in combination with blockchain can, can result in a lot and a lot of money and profit. It's because of the generation of what is called virtual contract or real-time contracts for supplies. And this is just one industry, which is the agriculture. I could repeat the same process for industry. I could repeat the same thing for other, any, whatever there is a contract with business involved. Think I mean? uh, another example of in the slides, I think I'm going to add it right now. So keep, and then I'm going to add it right here because when I created those slides, this wasn't there yet. We have what is called IoT enabled robotics. Robots or robotics, yeah? Or in other words, IORT. This is something that is starting very, very recently. I mean, uh, last year, maybe. Probably, yeah, I think because of the COVID-19, we are slowing it. I mean, it's slowing down, but it's definitely decent. And the idea behind it essentially is that when you have a robot or robots that are connected to the cloud, then through the IoT framework, and then their operation will be improved greatly through the IoT. Uh, maybe I use this example and as a way of that, because we have a robot, and then it's controlled through the Internet of Things. That's definitely one example. And in fact, I am publishing a paper on this one, and my title is actually IoT Enabled Robots. Um, I'm not promoting my work, I'm just saying that it's related to that field. So essentially, um, of course, other things you can use IoT to combine with Android, Google Cloud Services, and plenty of other um, open source uh, services out there. So if you, let's, why is this important? Let's say, if, let's say if I have a business or a company that works in robotics or involve robotics. And if I find out that IoT sensors can actually, or the data from IoT sensors can help my robots do their job, so of course I'm going to be interested. So once again, if you go to a robotics company and you tell them IoT sensors, you can watch it. And say, oh, no, I don't need that. I don't, I don't care about watching it. I can watch it in, in a different platform. But if you tell them that the data can be used to improve the operations of your robot and make them more efficient, then they will be interested. And that applies to just about everything. Every industry in the world can, or every industry possible out there, they could, its performance could always enhance using IoT data. Your automated system, your, your delivery, your, um, your, your, um, your, your, what do you call this thing? Your, um, your inventory warehouse or something like that. Rather than having a person manually going through your inventory, going through the items, you can have a couple of sensors, a few sensors installed somewhere, or strategically, and then you can have a, a live rec, a record of your of your of your inventory in real time. Um, plenty of examples of that. Now, the third utilizing, but before I go to this one, uh, any other examples about combining data or combining IoT data or integration of IoT data with other technologies? Any questions about this before I move on to the next slide? Okay, moving on. So now uh, the next point is using IoT data as a source of income. Uh, in other words, 
Uh, one way of saying this is monetizing IoT data, turning IoT data into actual money, into actual product you can sell. See here, in the first one, the idea was you use the data to, to improve your process. Okay, over here, you use the IoT data to improve another technology altogether. All right, but here you use the data, the data itself becomes a product. You sell it just like we sell anything else you want. An idea behind this is that this data, just as it is important for you to, or your business or your company, it could also become important to other companies. And the best way to do this is to visualize a bus service. And I think uh, rather than me talking or explaining to you this one, I'm going to show you. Uh, let me uh, open up this file. Just one second. Uh, where is that? Just one second, yeah, I'm getting something to show you, and then I'm gonna uh, show you a very nice video that actually shows you our the work on uh, IoT, uh, especially we show this part right here, visualization and so on. Mm. Let me uh, enable the voice from my screen so that uh, you can actually watch it and hear it as well. Uh, just give me a second, yeah? Okay, so I'm gonna play a video that is gonna last for about three minutes, but that video, by the way, this video actually is about uh, one of my IoT, uh, systems that we used. Uh, we actually participated in the Malaysia Technology uh, Expo back in January this year, MTE 2020. And uh, let me show you this video, change sound. So if you have sound, enable your sound now. Okay, um, I forgot to say that this is a draft of the video. It does not have audio. So I'll, I'll be talking through the video, throughout the video as well. Okay, so for this bus service, uh, the things we can do for purpose streamlining, we can identify, uh, see, if I have a bus service and I have a number of buses going through a number of routes, I would like to know which one of these routes is more useful or more in demand than others. This way I can then add more buses or more drivers to this route. I would also would like to know which is the, when is the peak time, when do I have more users and when do I have less users? 
I would also would like to know the driver's performance. If they are punctual on time, rude, not rude, etc. And also the vehicle performance. Uh, is it um, is the engine okay? Uh, is okay? Is it uh, is the performance is going all right, or do you need to conserve some time? And finally, some effective decisions like uh, beginning of the semester, um, season, semester break, uh, holidays, etc. So all of this information. Imagine that you already have this information when you use this system, the idea. Uh, I forgot to say that that was only the first part. This is now the second part. If you are the user of this service, let's say you, the students, are users of our application or our service, then you would know you would be able to have all of these features. You would monitor the bus in real time. Um, like you open the app and you can see where the bus actually is. I'm sure that this part right here is already available in other applications, but this is only the beginning. You will also be notified on the estimated time of arrival, which was about to reach, uh, whatever you wanted to reach. How many people in, the, in this bus? You will also see uh, how many people are actually sitting in the bus right now. How, have you ever waited for a bus and when the bus arrives, you realize it's already too full and you, can, and you don't want to really get in? And you would also know how many seats are available if you want to go there. And of course, uh, you will have an emergency alert. Like if you have a problem or something like that, you can let it Next. That was only part two. Then part three is secondary source of income. And this is for the company running the bus service. Uh, more on this later. So this is now how do we use the data coming from the system as an as, as, as a as an income stream, as a source of income. Um, who are the, um, and then let's see how this works in a minute. So the rest of the video will explain things more. So these are the three things that can, or this system provide. It captures information from these vehicles, process it, and then provides these services. Process streamlining, which reduces costs and reduce, uh, reduce um, yep, and reduce costs. And provide the positive user experience. Now, if you use, if you are happy with the service, then you would use the service more. Therefore, more income and more profit to the operator. And then finally, the data itself that we capture from here becomes a source of income. So, how does that work? So, this is an animation that shows the bus um, traveling. And you can actually monitor in real time what's going on with the car. Uh, and you can also monitor multiple vehicles at the same time, which is what is it right now. So let's pay attention here for a second. So right now, this is a Google map and something like that. You can monitor in real time where every bus is, and you can find out what's going on. Now imagine that your system or our system identified this green line here as a very in-demand route. And what is in demand means that a lot of people take this route more than anything else, uh, and they stop along the way. So if I have a property here, if let's say this is my house, then I can know that there will be a lot of traffic coming in and out, and there's a lot of buses coming in, because this is a very high in demand route. So therefore, I can increase the value of, the, of my property here, because I have an evidence that this actually is um, how do I say this? Um, that this is a very powerful route and there's a lot of people. Also, imagine if I have a shop here near the bus stop. And if I know that this is a very high in demand route, then I know for sure there's a lot of people going to be coming in or stepping out near my shop. So therefore, I know that my shop, or I would have evidence, not only do I know that I'm going to have a lot of people in front of my shop, but I would know when these people are going to come their behavior, which time of the month, which time of the year, which time of the day, or of the week, I'm going to have a lot of traffic, in, and how much is that traffic in front of my shop? So imagine if this shop was here, they would definitely be interested in this information. They would definitely want, want to know uh, how much volume of people will be in front of their shop, and when is that volume going to appear? So therefore, because of the information that I captured with my own sensors, I can then sell this information about user behavior or user patterns to this shop vendor right here. And this is how data can become a product. The data that you have in your system might be very, very useful to others. And therefore, you sell them that information.
information, it becomes a source of money. And get this, this information is continuously changing because the user behavior is changing. So the information is valid in real time. So not only it becomes useful as a, con a source of income, it becomes a continuous source of income. And you don't have to do anything. If the system running in the background, you capture continuously changing data. So you can sell every week for every month a new set of data. You can tell the guy, the guy or this guy or the shop owner, you know what, shop owner, I, I'm going to provide you with information or a report about user patterns every week. You have to pay me every week this much money. So obviously, because this guy would know that this is useful for, the, for, this, for their business, they will definitely pay real money for this information. So you have your sensors and all that stuff is running in the background and is generating money, real money for you. It's no longer about um, building a program or it's no longer about watching a website. It's about actual real solid money. Now imagine, and this is just one shop. Imagine if you have multiple shops along the route. Then you can sell the same set of information to every client or every one of these shops. And you can generate multiple combining and ever-changing source of income. And this is how uh, the, the IoT data monetization really works. Uh, the rest of the video is about other features that we have, like vehicle tracking, ETA, it gives you estimation time of arrival. Uh, you can also uh, monitor the situation of what happened, like passenger count, how many people going in and going out of the bus at any given time. Uh, I think I'm going to put a link to this video uh, in our group later on. Uh, like, let's say if the bus had an emergency, accident, breakdown, congestion, something like that, then also be notified. And this is another example. It's not just a bus, but this is a delivery uh, a van or a lorry. And you can actually monitor the cargo in real time, find out where every item is. And this can be expanded to anything, buses, trucks, uh, you know, emergency ambulances, and so on and so forth. So I just stop the video here. Uh, oh yeah, this IVMS system, uh, we participated in uh, Emulation Technology uh, Expo, and we won the Golden Award and, uh, for this system right here, representing Phoenix uh, And uh, let me show you this. Awards, awards, division awards. Yeah, this is basically our golden award that we won earlier in February this year for the vehicle performance and location monitoring system, the IBMS. And this was very, very recent this year. And my students are participants here, Kishan and Hafiz. These are both. Uh, uh, master students right now, but they are both veterans. And at, at some point, they were like you. They were final year or third year of engineering students, and they mechanical. They're both mechanical engineering students, and yet they are both now working on IoT and automation. Both of them, uh, Kishan also worked on the agriculture project, and Harvest has his own um, water management system, which I will show you later on as well. Okay, so this is essentially an example of. Uh, monetization. The data itself that you capture, you can then use it as a source of income to others. And then uh, this is basically one of the ways that IoT can become really, really powerful. Now the question obviously is, uh, okay, I know how this works for this particular example. What about other examples or other um, industries? How does this work? Well, obviously, um, this uh, particular example is fine. Okay, what about others? Well. For other systems, you will have to, uh, how do I monetize your data? Imagine that if you, um, you don't have to, if, imagine if you can go to a company right now, any business, and you go and tell them, you know what, guys, uh, I can show you that you can build a system for IoT, and I can show you how you can make money out of it. And um, I can show you exactly how you can put it as um, a, ref, um, a source of income. They will definitely be interested in listening to you. So how does it work is that you will have to develop an effective system for capturing and processing data. Well, this right here, which is the very first step right here, if you think about it for a second, uh, capturing, okay, processing, all right, and storing, okay, IoT data. 
Well, these three things, capturing, processing, and storing, are the very much main elements of the IoT framework. This is the source of data, capturing, this is the process storing, and this is the processing right here. So essentially, uh, the IoT framework is already does all of that. All you have to do is identify what kind of information you want to capture. And I think this is probably before here. You can have to, have to basically identify what data you want. Identify the data. What data do you want to capture? And then you may want to do encryption. You may want to uh, add some sort of security for your data and ensure some form of validation. Security and validation are ways to protect your data. You don't want your data to be exposed to anyone. Otherwise, anyone can take it and sell it. You would want to have some form of encryption, like password protection or some sort of encryption to make your data appear gibberish to anyone else, but only makes sense to you. And also, other validation means not anyone has access to your data, but only those who have the the, the you know the, the credentials. It could be managers or the bosses of the company, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you would want to identify possible clients that would be interested in such data. You see, in the bus example, you by understanding how the bus service works, then you would be able to understand how the shop owners would be interested in the data coming from the bus. You have to have an understanding of that situation. Well, similarly here, by capturing a set of data from a, from a certain business, you have to look at this data and try to ask this question, who would, be, who would also be interested in this data? Because whoever else will be interested in such data, it might be useless to you, or it might be millennial to you. But imagine if this data can actually come to you. Uh, imagine who would else want to do this data. Because as soon as you identify the client, then straight away, you can then make money. Because then you can approach these people, the, the potential client, and tell them, you know, here we go. I know that you are interested in something like this or this set of data or this information. I can provide you with this information continuously, every month, every week, at every day you want to, every interval of time you want. How much would you pay me for this? Or I will give you this data and I'm gonna sell you this information for this amount of money. If they are interested, they will buy it. If not, then move on to another client. Or maybe you can reduce the price. But whatever it is, it will always be a source of income. And then approach and sell your product. Now. If the company already have an IoT system and they already have this already, then you can actually then do it this way. You can develop the system and then look for clients, all right? But you can also start from here. You can actually come straight away and start here. You can approach the client first. You can tell them, hey client, what kind of information do you want? And you can ask them, what information do you actually need? And then based on their answer, you can then go and develop the system yourself. Because remember, the very first part of this process was to identify the data. Is that right? Maybe you do it yourself, and then you look for a client that needs this information. But then imagine that you can go to the client directly and ask them, you guys, what do you want? And then based on their answer, then develop a system that can actually get the, the data that they want. Them. And in fact, if you go this way, if you ask the client first, or potential client first, then you can actually ask for more money. When I did this training in Taiwan last year, I actually did it before the MCO started. We, I was invited to, to Taiwan to, to do training on IoT. And one of the students there gave me a brilliant idea. He said, I don't have to do engineering anymore. I can just become an IoT agent, which was cool, which was basically, essentially means I can just go to industry one by one, company by company, and ask them this question. What information do you want? And then I can look for another company that would or might provide this information then I can approach them and tell them, hey, you know what, guys, I can guide you into building the IoT system. You provide this information, and then you sell it to the other party, and then I get my cut. Which was brilliant. Imagine if you have like uh, five or six of those companies or arrangements, and you make money out of absolutely nothing. You have company A doing generating data, and company B acquiring data, and you're in the middle of making money. So that was an amazing idea that came out of one of the students from the Taiwan train which is really, really cool idea. Maybe one of you can take this idea and take it as a business. 
cool. Just remember to give me my cup. <laughs> okay, so now uh, that was the benefits or, or the potential of IoT, which is essentially uh, process streamlining, integration, and monetizing data. Okay, what's next? Now, when you talk about and when you talk about potential, you will feel, yeah, this is awesome. Let's do it. That's great. Why not everybody doing it? Well, that's because of the challenge. The challenges of implementing IoT is what is standing in the way right now uh, between us and achieving full or is what's preventing us from of realizing the benefits of IoT. Unfortunately, there are several challenges. I'm going to talk about those. Every one of these lines in the whole slide in the index in the slide. So, in, in short form of answer, um, IoT in general is a multidiscipline uh, form of science. See, when you think of mechanical engineering, it's a, that's one discipline, mechanical. If you think, think of electronics or electric, okay, electrical, that's one discipline. If you think of electronics, that's another discipline. Software engineering, another discipline. Civil, okay, you get the idea. So every one of these is a discipline on its own. IoT, by nature, it's a multidiscipline um, or multidisciplinary um, field. Meaning, you have to have experience in mechanical, in electronic, electrical, electronics, networking, in web development, in database design, and blah, blah, blah. So many other things you have to know. I didn't say you have to be expert in, but at least you have to know in order to work on IoT efforts. So that's one challenge, and more on that in a minute. Um, some challenges are specific for each sector. Like some challenges are apparent only for agriculture. Some challenges are only for industry, and so on. Then technological challenges I'm going to explain in a minute, and then of course you have the socio-economic challenges. I'm going to explain that one as well in a minute. So let's talk about the first one, which is the very nature of IoT. See, uh, unfortunately. I mean, although IoT right now, or, or at least currently, is usually taught by the E and E department, that's because it involves programming, sensors, electrical circuits, web development, and all of these topics that are usually or historically taught in E and E department. However, the number one client or the number one users of IoT is mechanical field, believe it or not. And I'm going to show you this also in an evidence. Uh, on there as well. So, yeah. I'm going to show you a diagram. Where is that? So, I'm going to show you a diagram that I found from. Okay. I think I, I opened the PowerPoint. Okay, so let me uh, tell you. Maybe not all of this. I just want to show you a specific diagram. Let's see. Oh, it's not here. Should be here. One second. Oh, wrong file, sorry. By the way, let's take a look at this diagram. See, uh, if you are a mechanical engineer watching this, yeah, you'll be happy to watch this. This is, uh, uh, this is coming from Forbes, or sorry, this is coming from uh, EMSI, your post analytics. It's comparing the, the number of practical, uh, basically, excuse me, the, this is the, the job offerings. Which the blue stuff is the job offers or the job openings. And uh, the, the bright color is the hirings, like they got the job or they, the, the jobs were filled. Now, take a look at civil, mechanical, in, uh, others, uh, industrial, and look at all of the E and E stuff. Electrical engineering, electronics engineering, Computer and aerospace. Um, okay, 
So essentially, if you look at industrial plus mechanical and plus civil, if you want to be nice to them, you can think of you can you can see clearly that how much that mechanical uh, mechanical practitioners basically mechanical. Um, I, mean, I know that mechanical here, but these are also our cousins, the mechanic, the industrial people, and as well our small or minions, uh, the civil guys. So you can see clearly that civil, mechanical, and industrial, these three fields are biggest, and everything else combined. Yeah, which means what? Which means that although this is about the job market, but also an indication of about um, the availability of positions and also the number of engineers in the field. Meaning, although that IoT is usually taught by the E&E department, right? But the biggest users of IoT is the mechanical people, mechanical and industrial. You get know I me? Mean? So, although that currently speaking, it's usually taught by E&E department, but we, the mechanical engineers, as well as the industrial guys, and even the civil, if you want to count them with us, are the biggest users of IoT. You get know I me? Mean? So that's why. Uh, uh, the, the, the argument that this is that E and E stuff um, it's not valid anymore. It has to be um, you have to have a multiple set of skills. You and see you have to have um, knowledge in mechanical design, you have to or at least electromechanical design. You have to be, you have familiarity with programming, web applications, sensors, actuators and controllers, and networking and utilization. And if you think about it closely, right, you realize that Everything you see here, we will do this semester. And this is the very purpose of this course right here. Uh, we will, this part right here, you already learned or you're learning now in, this, in, in your course of mechanical engineering learning. But in this semester, we will do this and we will do this um, briefly. We will definitely do all of this and then we will slightly do this as well. So, you're going to learn all the skills that is needed to become professional in IoT. And you are a mechanical engineering student. So basically, you are getting the best of all of the worlds, not both worlds. You're learning, you're, you are coming from the biggest uh, field or field of engineering, both in uh, colleges or universities in education as well as in the industry, but also you're learning uh, about IoT as well. And you're learning it from the from the mechanical engineering point of view as well, which is also an advantage as well. Now, the problem that IoT is multidisciplinary by nature is difficult or even impossible to find a program like a. Uh, if you look at our programs now in Unitain or every other university that you have, you will always see mechanical engineering degree, civil engineering degree, EME degree. Uh, some universities will have mechatronics degree, uh, something like that. You will never ever see robotics degree, or maybe there is, but very, very rare. Or you will never see IoT engineering degree. This will be my dream job, by the way, to develop an engineering program to, to a four years engineering program that fits this profile. But I don't think uh, it's going to be available anytime soon. So that's why the problem with it. If you are coming from the mechanical engineering background, you will have problems with the programming or software. If you are coming from the E&E &E department, you would not know the mechanical side of things. If you are network engineering, then you would not know mechanical or, you know, or control. So there's always some problem or something that you don't know when you're coming from one of these fields. So that's why the only way for you to do, uh, to, to be proficient in IoT is to learn yourself. When I, I finished my degree, my actual bachelor's degree in manufacturing engineering, or you can say industrial. My master's was on mechanical as well, but I, uh, I'm sorry, was on mechatronics. Then my PhD was on computer software. So you can say I diversed my own education. I went through the fields. And so I couldn't do civil, unfortunately. So, so yeah, so you know. So basically that's why I divert, I di sort of diverted my own education to be fit as much as possible into all of the fields that I was interested in. So you as a learner of this field, or let's say the problem is not just with a student. Let's say I'm a company. I'm a, I'm a manager of the company, and I would like to implement IoT. But me as a manager, I have my own background. You see, when you talk to a manager of a business, they will have their own educational background or experience. 
they might be experienced only in mechanical engineering or only in electrical engineering. They're not familiar with other fields. So they won't understand it when you talk about IoT. I actually have seen this myself. Again, in the same building in Taiwan, uh, apart from the Riverwood University, I also visited some of the companies, and they were very much interested in IoT, but when I tried to talk to them about it, they were a little bit vague about some of the elements of it because, again, coming from their own educational background. Uh, see, once again, they, they might be coming from mechanical only or electrical only, and then when you talk to them about IoT, they will be lost when it comes to part of it which is outside of their field. It's again a problem with IoT in general because people, difficult to learn it, difficult to implement it because they don't know, they are not properly uh, versed in these areas. You are lucky guys that you're, you're having this course when you're doing mechanical side. Uh, I really hope that you guys uh, uh, use this opportunity and improve on it. Moving on. Now, okay, what does that mean by application specific? Applications, or, um, or I think this was not called application specific, it was called sector. Yeah, sector or application at the same time. I think the word sector is better. So sector specific challenge. Sector specific, as the name implies, means is that some sectors have their own challenges, while the others don't have. Um, for example, agriculture applications, because they are in the outdoors, the challenge would be, okay, let me ask you a question. Right now, when you are in your house or in your classroom or anywhere indoors, you will always have Wi-Fi. But in the outdoors of the agriculture field, no Wi-Fi, right? Therefore, the device, you know, remember when I told you earlier about this example, and I told you that we put sensors in the field, and I remember I told you that these sensors don't have to be connected to the internet. They have to have a network card. I can put a network card, but then I still need a hotspot. Where or how am I going to provide a hotspot here? There's no Wi-Fi in the outdoors. Actually, there is a form of Wi-Fi in the outdoors, but it's a special version of Wi-Fi. But then in this case, you will have to provide the internet yourself. Either you use the special version of Wi-Fi for the outdoors, or you have to provide uh, hotspots in your field. That will actually cause problems. Because those hotspots will also need, you also need power, by the way, electrical power to run these sensors and these network devices. So that will also add a little bit of infrastructure, you need wires, you need um, stuff like that. So you have to manage all of that. When it comes to agriculture, so no Wi-Fi, no power, and, infrastructure issues, infrastructure. Of course, there are solutions to these problems. You can say we can use solar, which is definitely usable because the amount of power needed for sensors is minor, so we can use solar. We can use um, RELA, that RELA, long range, LoRa, yes. Uh, LoRa is a long range uh, Wi-Fi uh, module. So LoRa is a special version uh, I think the word is LoRa, yeah, LoRa. LoRa essentially is a long-range Wi-Fi and can be used just like the regular Wi-Fi, but it has its own downfalls as well. So again, although there are solutions, but it's still a challenge. You still have to work and fix your system around it. Industrial application, the challenges, of course, is that um, um, basically uh, every factory, it's difficult to have integration or difficult to have common grounds. Uh, I think the key word here is infrastructure. Infrastructure, what do you mean by infrastructure? Uh, connection, yeah, connection, power. Okay, the other here, what do you mean by common ground? Common ground means, see, um, I have one factory, and this factory, I bought, I used the machine from one supplier. I have another factory in, next door, but that factory, I bought machines from another supplier. So even though I can connect building A and building B together, but because of these machines are different, they are not the same, um, they are not using the same machine, so therefore I might, might have compatibility issues. Uh, also, uh, 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 the information that I want, or you know what, this, is, this issue will come later. But for now, I think the other issue is uh, depth and breadth of data. You see, in agriculture, you might need maybe five or six 
different information. That's it. Uh, temperature, moisture, uh, ripeness, um, maybe fertilizer. That's it. Maybe five or six things that you were looking for. But when it comes to industrial, like a factory, you could be looking for a thousand different pieces of information. Uh, let me let me explain that. What does that mean? Um, if you, in order to broadcast five different sets of information, you probably need five sensors. Okay, let's just say that. But if if you want to capture one thousand different pieces of information, you might need one thousand sensors. You can hopefully see the difficulty in infrastructure. So that's why, um, because you need a, a significant more amount of information, then this would require more work to do. Smart homes, uh, because smart homes uh, deal directly with us humans, so straight away comes the issue of human-robot interaction, or sometimes it's called human-technology interaction. How do we as human feel about the technology uh, or about robots? Some people are very happy to have um, IoT in their homes or a robot running around and doing things for them. But some other people are scared. They feel that the robots are a challenge or, or are a um, threat. They might feel that this robot <laughs> is going to Nothing you want to Well, thank you for that uh, contribution. Okay, so getting back here. So basically, uh, yeah, so once again, um, smart homes. Uh, yeah, so basically, um, not everyone is relatively happy or, or willing to, to have technology in their home. So this fear or this, uh, you know, reaction to it might make us not want to have it and therefore might make the system not work or operate great. Uh, uh, Smart cities, which is another purpose of using IoT, is um, we we would love to have it, but we already have a, an existing infrastructure. And we don't want to mess it up. You see, um, and, and a lot of times infrastructure, infra, in, okay. So, in, in a lot of time, uh, especially when it comes to a lot of times. Uh, governments or cities, they would love to have IoT, but then they do not want to uh, rebuild their infrastructure. They do want to start from scratch. Unfortunately for many, many cities, if you want to incorporate IoT, you might want to, um, what's the word here? Catch out the infrastructure or maybe mess up with the infrastructure or disturb. I think the English word for catch out is disturb. You might have to go underground, you might have to dig in the wiring or the pipings and install things. And all of that might not be uh, the current the cities or government, they don't want to do it, or they don't want to mess it up, or they don't have the money to do it. So this could be a problem. Uh, drone IoT or involving or combining drones or drone technology with IoT is the fact that the device is moving continuously. And when you have the drone moving continuously, it will continuously disconnect and reconnect with the internet. And that disconnection or reconnection might cause uh, the connection or the, you know, the network IoT network to shut down because you might have a, a specific set of uh, configuration based on IP address. And when the drone moves to another tower, for example, it will change the IP address and therefore the settings will not work anymore. So these are just examples of sector specific challenges and problems that we could have. Uh, I need to move faster, right? Okay, so because it's already five o'clock and we haven't yet started chapter three. I think we're almost done here because after this comes the case studies and this one you can watch on your own and yourself. But I think we can, yeah, a couple of more slides and then we'll finish this chapter and then after the break we do uh, chapter three. Okay, so this one we finished already. So now what about technological challenges? I think we're gonna finish this and then we're gonna take a break. There are these two slides only and then we can make a break. Technological challenges of IoT is, of course, we talked about this briefly, is that you have to have some protection 
against your data. You don't want your data to be lost or you know stolen, so therefore you need cybersecurity problems, or at least knowledge in that. That's why very recently, in recent years, cybersecurity itself has become a big field because it is used to protect against data uh, theft. So that's why uh, it's becoming really powerful itself. Another limitation to your system could be the network capabilities. Um, you want to broadcast 1,000 pieces of data, but then unfortunately the network does not allow this much data at the same time. You have to. Um, this, by the way, happens in agriculture, for example. In agriculture, um, we cannot. Um, one of the advantages of agriculture is that things don't change quickly, so we can broadcast data maybe once a day or once every hour or something like that. It's fine. But some other industries, you need the data in real time. So that's why this could actually become a problem. Uh, for example, uh, in agriculture, maybe you don't need data in real time. You can wait for a few hours, or maybe even a day. But industrial application, you need the information in actual real time. And also you need another one. Maybe I can add the point right here. Also in real or near real time. So if you, because you need the data in real time and you need a lot of data, so you need a huge bandwidth of your connection. Not only do you need a fast internet speed, you also need to have a lot of bandwidth. Bandwidth, think of the bandwidth like the width of the highway, not the highway. If you have a highway, which is great, but it it's only contains two lanes only, then we're going to get a traffic jam. For those who ballet kampong every holiday, they know what I'm talking about. But if the highway has three or four lanes, then there will be less traffic. Once again, those guys who ballet kampong every, every holiday, they will know what I'm talking about. Uh, for the international students, ballet kampong means go home to your hometown um, by driving a car or a bus, whatever. If you're driving back to your hometown or going taking the highway, and you're driving in the highway that it has about three to four lanes, you will experience less or no traffic jams. But if the highway only contains two lanes, then it will be jammed. And the width of the highway can be considered in the internet speak, in the internet language, as the bandwidth. You might have a very good, right here in the internet, in the Unitan connection, is another nice example. We might have very high speed in internet in Unitan, but we might not have good bandwidth. But if you go home to your own connection, you will have maybe less speed, but then you have higher bandwidth, and that's why you can do more with your connection at home. So this is an example. Now, if you are industrial, it requires very high bandwidth, but your network is unable to provide it, then you're going to have a problem. This could be sometimes a real problem to some industries. And this is the point I mentioned earlier, which is com incompatibility of hardware and software. You might have a machine in your warehouse, but that machine requires Windows. But then your IoT device runs on Linux. Then once again, you're going to have to find a way to bridge between Linux and Windows. Once again, this is solvable and easy to do. But then again, it's an extra headache that you have to deal with. Sometimes the data that is kept, uh, another example, you might be using um, a Raspberry Pi IoT device, but then your friend is might be using uh, Arduino. Again, these two things are different, they use different programming languages and so on and so forth. So again, knowledge of different machines and different hardware would require a little bit of uh, knowledge so that you can actually solve this problem. Last part we talk about now before we take a break is uh, the social challenges otherwise known as socioeconomic, oops, economic. Socioeconomic or social slash economic challenges are basically uh, not related to engineering or technology, but us as a society. Um, you might not be aware of IT at all, or you even know what it's all about. Uh, you might not even accept it. You don't want it. You don't like IT altogether. So if you're not aware or not, don't have acceptance, then you or your business might not be interested in doing it. Uh, your education or knowledge or experience is very narrow and in discipline, you're focused only on one discipline. So therefore, you're not familiar with the other aspects of IT, therefore you won't be able to implement it. And of course, the last part, which would be, again, the lack of 
uh, laws and policies. Maybe it's illegal to use a device and capture user information using your bus. Maybe it's against the law. Right now, because this is all new, so this is basic. Maybe there's a law against selling this information to others. But right now, as it stands, there is no information or there's no laws or policies about IoT implementation. But maybe tomorrow there will be. So imagine that you have developed a system and you're capturing information and you're making money, and then suddenly tomorrow it becomes illegal. So this is a real challenge, and this is there's nothing uh, against it or nothing to predict it. Right now, I'll tell you that this is no such law, but you never know what happens in the future. So you might want to jump in right now before they close the door. Okay, that's it. I think the success stories is available right now. You can actually go in. In the success story, I actually show you my own projects, and uh, this is actually some of our actual projects that we developed. And this is the the water management system. This is the this is the one with the agriculture sensor system. And uh, this actually, we have a patent for this, uh, and also a patent for this one as well. Um, precision agriculture, this is some of the, by the way, this also was a capstone project, believe it or not, and was converted later on into a master's project. Uh, this is the bus service, the, you saw it already at IVMS, we, it was originally about buses only, but then we expanded it to any vehicle. This is the camera dolly, the project that I showed you the slides before. Uh, this is the actual design that we built. Uh, it's, we basically look like a, a, tri a tripod, which we have a cross verify here. Actually, I have the real deal in my office if you'd like to come and see it. Uh, this is the actual design parameters, uh, circuit desired for one robot, a program sample, and this is the picture you saw earlier. And with this, we finished chapter two, and we after the break, we're gonna come to chapter three, which is embedded system. And I'm, I know that I've been a bit slow, but don't worry, the chapter three slides are only 10 slides together, actually nine or actually eight if you remove the first two slides. So these eight slides we will cover during the last hour of the session today, and then we will finish with our um, chapter three. So as of this point, we are ready, you are ready for assignment two, which is about IoT, and assignment one, which is about fundamentals. We're gonna take a short break for, a five, for about five minutes, and then we are going to uh, continue with this chapter two. So I'll see you in five, see you at the, uh, take a break.
Okay, welcome back. So, welcome back. And let's share the screen. Okay, so let's finish this last hour of the session today, and then we can actually complete uh, our the first part of our course, which is the theoretical and stuff like that. Next week, the class or the session will be slightly different. It will not be. It will no longer be theory and me babbling through the theory stuff. It will be me doing work. I will be basically doing programming and stuff like that. So anyway, let's just finish the session. So the last part is embedded systems. And what is embedded systems? And what are we going to talk about? What is actually the meaning of it? So, uh, okay, so obviously the first thing we talked about was microcontrollers, which we briefly talked about in the, in the fundamental section, but we'll, we'll add more into it. We also talk about system on chips. The different meanings of it, and then we will introduce um, few embedded systems. I know that this particular setup we will be working primarily with Arduino, but uh, you still need to know or learn about Raspberry Pi, and as well as the other guy, which is BeagleBone. Excuse me. And when I say you need to learn about it, you need to know what it is, and a bunch of other things we're going to learn about, and comparisons and stuff like that, and pros and cons of using it. It just so happens that you will be only working hands on or the practical part only this semester with Arduino. In fact, this course never really specified, if you go to the course outline, never really said that you will specifically work with a particular embedded system. We purposely left it be open so that the course can be changed or updated as we go along. Right now, Arduino is happening, Raspberry Pi is happening, and BeagleBone is also happening, but we don't use it hands-on, even in the lab. However, uh, this could change. We could perhaps switch to BeagleBone in future semesters, or we could introduce yet another um, system with the new technology comes along, and then we could do it or use it. So don't get uh, sort of distraught that we are no longer using Raspberry Pi this semester. It's, this was never the plan all along. It was just it just so happened that we would plan to do it last semester, but because of the MCO, we will only focus on Arduino. Uh, but next semester on, but you still need to learn it about it. And so on. of course, I'm going to provide you with the opportunity if you want to do it. The available resources are all there, but you may need to get the hardware yourself. Uh, in the lab, we already have 30 sets of Arduinos and Raspberry Pis for this course. And we would provide you with the, with all the hardware you need to work on this course for free, of course. Um, unfortunately, all of that is not available to us right now. We would have to um, essentially live or work with the virtual lab um, for now. But you're still going to learn the same principles on Arduino, whether it's virtual or not, and you're still going to learn the same principles on IoT. Now, uh, I'll talk about the hands-on part later, but then I'm just going to tell you that if you would like to do hands-on, real hands-on, not virtual, but in your own uh, house or wherever, you can still do it. No problem. This course will still teach you to do that. So whether you want to build it in actual physical hands-on or in virtual hands-on, the course we're going to introduce this semester will still help you out. Okay, so we're going to, if, if at least in the theory part, we will learn about these three guys, but practical for this semester only Arduino. Then we're going to talk about, uh, oops, uh, yeah, we're still here. We're going to talk about combinations and comparison between the above. We're also going to talk about briefly about the integrated development environment, uh, which is basically the space or the place where you're going to be doing your programming. And also, we're going to talk about a little bit about programming languages themselves and talk about them. And finally, we're going to talk about this guy right here. Um, I can tell you from experience that, uh, I can tell you from your own experience that when you did programming before, one of the biggest headaches that you suffered from was errors or debugging. And I'm going to introduce you through the process of minimizing this headache 
and uh, how you can systematically approach your programming uh, task to avoid having problems and minimize the debugging issues. So that's, uh, I think there's one more element here, which is C++. Yeah, I think we're gonna talk about uh, also here is Python versus C++, or C++ versus Python, the programming language. Or maybe it was part of this guy, but I'll, I'll take that. Okay, so let's talk about, um, first of all, microcontrollers. I think the introduction to microcontrollers was already, um, done in the in the fundamental oh sorry it's here um you know what let's reopen chapter one again let's come back here why so six seven two one oh. yeah okay so we talked about uh microcontrollers before and uh, you might see several words that might sound different but they also can be used interchangeably processor microprocessor microcontroller controller these are all basically uh, more or less the same thing micro the word micro is here, so processor micro or without microcontroller and then you have of course cpu which is obviously a micro uh, processing unit. A processor or a controller could be interchangeable, could be both doing the same. Of course, when you go online and you look at the definitions, you will see plenty. But more or less, they all do the same thing. So why, and why we call this a processor, why this is a controller? Well, a processor sometimes process information, but then it does not control anything. It just gives more information to other elements. Or it processes the information, but then it uses that information. It's in its own operation. It doesn't really change anything else. A controller, on the other hand, uses the information to control something else. This is a minor difference, vague difference, and uh, sometimes it's ignored because every processor must control something, whether it's a hardware device or a software device, it's irrelevant. And the micro part is just about the size of it. So, um, sir, do we have a nano controller? Yes, we do. So again, we, uh, so is there a processor with that micro? Yes. So again, the size of it, these are all just different ways of saying the same thing. So a microcontroller, uh, a controller essentially, or a microcontroller is a device that is, like we talked about last week, receives input information, does some sort of uh, logical decision making, and then sends output information. This is the, the gist of it of every controller, processor, and so on out there. Every processor needs information to process, and then once it does the operations, and then it sends an output command, every one of them. But what is important for us today is to learn about what do you mean, what are the differences between controller on chip and computer on chip? And um, what do you mean by chip to begin with? Right? So what happened to that other window? So, when we talk about, yeah. if you look at the picture of the microcontroller, um, what is it? It is a, a good example. Ah, you know what? Um, board. Let's add the word board here. Okay, that's a fantastic example. Okay, that's a nice one because this one right here is the Raspberry Pi board right here. I will come to this in a minute later on. I just want to show you that this board right here that you're looking at right now, only this part, and actually not even this part, smaller part of this part is the microcontroller or the controller. The rest of the, the thing you're looking at right now is just the board. Now, what do you mean by board? Well, that means essentially um, you, it, the controller alone is just one device. But it, like I said earlier, it needs to receive information. Where is it going to receive it from? Well, it has to receive it from some form of input. So over here on the board, you have several places where the information can come in. And then, okay, after that, we need to output that information. So once again, from the controller, it goes to the output. So 
in order to allow, and then of course there are miscellaneous components that facilitate the, the input and output information. Like yes, uh, you have um, um, energy uh, processing units, uh, you have power sources, you have capacitors and conductors, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, okay, so what do you want? So basically, um, imagine if you have, see, okay, so is there a controller without a board? Yes, actually there is. And let me remove this board right here and show you a controller. Here we go. This right here is a controller without anything else. And it should be one example of that. All of these are all microcontrollers, microprocessors, you name it. In fact, you can go to the Wikipedia page right now and take a look at it. You can actually read more about all of these. Okay, and okay, these are lovely because these are actually some of these things that you can see. Right? You can actually learn about the history of it and so on and so forth. But then a controller uh, without going into E and E design, and you don't have to go through this because this is what's inside uh, these guys right here. I can tell you a lot from the gist of it that what's going on inside here that you have a, a number of transistors and other electronics um, components that facilitate the processing or the logic control, uh, you know, uh, doing a decision making. I don't want to go any further because that will become DLD or digital logic design. I don't want to go through that. I actually did study DLD and I'm not sure if you guys are going to study it or not, but for now, um, let's just, it's safe to say that inside here, there is a set of micro size or micro systems, a micro electromechanical system, uh, sorry, a micro electrical systems that uh, mainly transistors that will actually perform the logic and make the decision making process. Okay, and that will be the last time we're going to talk about this. What we care about is the device itself, which is the microcontroller. This is a microcontroller on its own. And if you want to work with it, you have to build a circuit around it to work with it. You know what I mean? Uh, uh, okay, so this is essentially um, the, what do you mean by a microcontroller? I can see there's another example of a microcontroller, which is right here. And uh, this is the Intel Core, which is a CPU, obviously, controller, right? But then this is without the rest of the board. You can see this is an example of the controller or the CPU with the board and so on. By the way, this tiny thing over here, yeah, I can see it. Hopefully, no, don't, okay. So yeah, this tiny thing here, I mean, when I say tiny, I mean relative to the rest of the board, right, is the controller and everything else is just support components, and stuff like that. So once again, uh, essentially, uh, these are the, the information that, oh, this is the, the names, or oh, this is the, what I mean by controller versus controller board, or controller on chip. Now, this board right here, as if you have a desktop, you can actually open it and you can see the motherboard as we refer to it. This motherboard will have the CPU plus um, slots where you can insert other cards. Now, you have memory cards, you have, um, what else, RAM, you have, Power source, these are all things that have to be connected to the same, to the motherboard as well. So the CPU or the, excuse me, the computer or the desktop not only contains the motherboard, but you have other components, the hard drive, the, the CD-ROMs, if you're still using those, the DVD-ROMs, the, the, and plenty of other components you have in your desktop. So what is then the meaning of controller on chip? Controller on chip, or yeah, the controller on chip essentially is the microcontroller plus its miscellaneous components. What does that mean? It means essentially uh, this guy plus what it needs or other components in order to perform its operations. Well, we've seen an example of that. In fact, a very nice example of a controller on chip is the good old, but it's other, none other than Arduino. In fact, the very definition of an Arduino <coughs> is that it is actually a controller on chip. Oh, I don't want to go to Bazaar or Shopee, right? <laughs> now is the wrong time to hang. Okay, here we go. So here's an example of a controller on chip. Uh, a controller on chip essentially in the Arduino circuit. Do you have a better view of this? No? Uh, actually, yeah, uh, yeah, sure, why not? Ah, lovely. 
So this is an Arduino chip, and uh, this right here is the microcontroller, and everything else is here are support or miscellaneous components. And this whole thing is exactly or almost the same size of your ID card or your name card. It's very small, and it contains all of the components that it would need. So that's why it's referred to as a computer, uh, excuse me, a controller on chip. The controller on a chip is a microcontroller plus its own miscellaneous components, and they all fit into a size of a card or a, a chip. So could this become smaller? Of course, we could actually have, in fact, the Arduino is a, an example of this, but we could have smaller examples. In fact, if you go to Arduino, there are different versions of Arduino. This is even a smaller Arduino. This is Arduino Nano, because it's even a smaller controller and a smaller, the whole thing is actually, is this guy right here is almost the same size of this guy, right? Actually, it is, but it is different in the sense that this is just a microcontroller, whereas this is a microcontroller, smaller one, plus miscellaneous input, output, and power source, and so on. You know what I mean? So, so what's the big deal, sir? I mean, they're all of the same. They're all controller. Actually, it's not. A controller and chip essentially. Uh, wait, one second. Let's go back to the correct slide. Yeah. All right, so, so what's that difference? A controller and chip is a microcontroller plus its component. So it's ready for you to work with. All you have to do is link it to your input and output devices and you're good to go. But a microcontroller on its own, you have more work to do. Because not only you have input and output, you also have to build the circuit that the microcontroller needs. In other words, you need to build these guys separately. And that is where the E&E &E, uh, people learn. They will learn what the microcontroller is and how to build this circuit around it, and then they will actually use it. For us mechanical guys, we don't need to go that far. All we have to do is uh, to work with this guy right here, the microcontroller, or it's going to be the controller on chip, just linking our input and output devices, and we're good to go. Okay, but then you will learn later on that the microcontroller or the Arduino eventually is not enough. It cannot work on its own. So I've seen it before, it does work. Yeah, it does, but then you cannot program it on its own. You need to connect it to a laptop or a computer. And therefore, that's why it's called controller on chip and not computer on chip. Because a controller on chip, yes, it has a microcontroller, but it cannot work on its own. It's not a system, an independent system. A computer on chip is an independent system that can work on its own. In other words, it can operate as its own device. And therefore, you can actually, uh, basically, you can actually becomes completely independent. It doesn't need any other device to work. An example of that, can somebody guess? The Raspberry Pi. So the Raspberry Pi is right here. Actually, is a com complete computer on chip. What does that mean? It means you are looking right now if you have a desktop, if you remember a desktop, what do the one contain? Motherboard, power source, um, memory card, RAM. Yeah, forget anything else. Uh, and then input uh, and input and output devices, right? Well, uh, the input and output devices is the keyboard and monitor. Let's just forget about the keyboard and monitor for a second and focus on the content of the CPU. When I say CPU, I mean that box that you have next to the monitor and keyboard. Well, right here you are looking at the CPU right here. This is the RAM and uh, power source is right here and the hard drive is also here. You're basically looking at the whole computer right here. The only thing missing, of course, is the keyboard and mouse and those guys you connect through the USB right here. And that's it. This is essentially a complete computer on chip. And this again is the same size of the RAM. And all you have to do is connect it to the input and output and power source keyboard and mouse and you're good to go you have a complete computer running on its own it has its own operating system linux based operating system and it runs just like so another example of the computer on chip is beaglebone beaglebone black uh, is a version of beaglebone but again this is another computer on chip we're going to actually watch through the differences between them and then we can actually discuss the differences Okay, so okay, let me close this and let me close this. So now let's talk about uh, okay, save. 
So now let's say now we talk about the comparison and the differences. The Arduino Uno, which is a version of Arduino, versus the Texas Instruments EMS 1000. Well, this is obviously a computer a controller on chip, whereas this is just a microcontroller on its own. And I've shown you the pictures before. So once again, uh, what is the Arduino example? Right here. Oh no, this is still Raspberry Pi. So this is a, what is it? Yeah, so this is the Raspberry, the Arduino one. So obviously this is a controller on chip, whereas this guy right here is a controller only, microcontroller only. So therefore you can see that the Arduino is a microcontroller on chip, whereas the, which means it is a microcontroller along with its support and miscellaneous components such as capacitors, transistors, blah, 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 blah. Whereas the Texas Instruments is a microcontroller only without anything else. You have to build the, the miscellaneous component yourself. All right, more comparison. Arduino Uno versus Raspberry Pi 3. At the time, these two were the, the latest in technology in both Arduino and Raspberry Pi. Right now, we have more than Arduino Uno, and we have Raspberry Pi 4. I think 5 coming soon. But for now, uh, we're going to we continue to use Pi 3. This is the hardware we have. OK, comparison then. So the areas of comparison between Raspberry Pi by the way, this comparison is not necessarily just for Raspberry Pi 3 and Arduino Uno. It's generally between Raspberry Pi in general as well as Arduino in general. So again, the definition, the Raspberry Pi is a low-cost single board computer on chip, whereas the Arduino Uno is a controller on chip. Uh, connectivity abilities, the Raspberry Pi is already made with connection. It can go with Bluetooth, cable, as well as Wi-Fi whereas the Arduino is not connected. At least this version is not connected. So there is Arduino with internet. Yes, there is, but for this particular example, we will continue. And I will talk about this later, why I'm using this Arduino and not the one ready with connection. Uh, there is pros and cons, and we will talk about that later. Uh, available ports, the Raspberry Pi come with HDMI, audio, USB, four USBs, and for this particular Pi, camera, and LCD. I mean ports for the camera and port it doesn't come with a camera. It comes with a port for the camera and a port for an LCD and a memory. Uh, the Arduino Uno does not come with any ports, but you'll have you can connect them separately. It means you have to you need another piece of hardware basically. Application, this, this is a basically a, the, the Raspberry Pi is a computer on chip. So because it's a own, own computer we can do complex tests like any other computer can do. Uh, of course, it has limitation in capabilities, but it is a computer that can, can do complex operations. The Arduino is a controller, so it's limited. So you can think of, again, uh, controller versus CPU. So the Arduino, you can think of the Arduino as a controller, whereas the Raspberry Pi is a CPU. So you can see the differences between them. Areas of usage, and again, whatever you need a full-fledged computer, whereas this one, you need a specific task that can be repetitive. Um, there's uh, advantages and, and disadvantages. You might think the Raspberry Pi is advantageous, but actually the Arduino Uno has its own advantages. Of course, the number one advantage is cost because it's much cheaper than the Raspberry Pi. But also, you see, because the Arduino Uno does not have its own operating system, and also because it's much simpler in architecture, therefore it is actually a lot faster than the Raspberry Pi. So if you want something repetitive and you want it to be done very, very rapidly, then your friend is Arduino. But if you want something complex in operation and you don't mind the delay, when I say delay, I'm talking about microseconds here, then your best friend is my, uh, the Raspberry Pi. Also, if you were talking about cost, because if you, let's say, remember the 1,000 example, 1,000 piece of information, that might require 1,000 sensors, and therefore might be 1,000 Arduinos, or 1,000, maybe 500 Arduinos. It's still, that's a lot. But then again, uh, you would, might, um, to buy 500 Arduinos would be a lot cheaper compared to buying 500 pies. As an example, an Arduino could be worth roughly 10 ringgit a piece, but the Raspberry Pi is worth about 200 to 300 ringgit a piece. So you can see the differences now between them. But on the other hand, the Raspberry Pi has a lot of features here that would be worth your money. The Arduino is cheaper, but then it has a, a lot of things not available. You might need to buy other hardware just to make them available. So again, 
do not think, uh, you have to think about yeah, the decision about going for Arduino or Raspberry Pi. It depends on the task at hand and whether or not uh, what you need to do, both in the software and in hardware. Okay, so we know that the Raspberry Pi and the BeagleBone are both computer and chip, but then what is the difference between them? Well, we talked about the similarity. The difference between them is that, first of all, the Raspberry Pi came first. It was developed by the Raspberry Pi Foundation in the UK, and it was developed first. The BeagleBone was developed by Texas Instruments. And you might be thinking, so what? Well, Texas Instruments is the place where microcontrollers were first developed in history. If you go back to that Wikipedia post and you read about this, you will read that the first microcontroller or processor was first developed in Texas Instruments. So they are the historical fathers of, of essentially of the, of the concept of microcontrollers. Uh, can't find it somewhere here, but you will find it somewhere here that this is where this was done. Uh, and uh, you will read more about the history of this and you will see that it was actually in Texas Instruments. So the very fact that the BeagleBone was made by them gives them actually great uh, abilities. Actually, in fact, it, it's other benefits. The Raspberry Pi runs its own Linux version of Linux. Uh, let me say that again. It runs its own version of Linux operating system. Um, it's a special Linux only for Raspberry. Now, if you know what Linux is, or you are familiar, then you will know that Linux is an open source operating system, just like Android. And, and then you would know that the Android that Google makes is different from the Android that running on, uh, say, Samsung, or running on Oppo, or any other Android phone. That Android is different, because you have a different version of Android for each manufacturer. You get what I mean? So that's why you will need, uh, you will have different features. So think of the Raspbian as a special version of Linux only for the Raspberry Pi, whereas BeagleBone runs Linux Ubuntu, which is, imagine that this is the, the, the Google version of Android, which is the class or the standard version of Linux. So if you are familiar with Linux, you will know that Ubuntu is a standard, sort of the common used, um, let's think about it this way. Imagine we have Windows, which we all use, and then you have a special Windows just for your TV. You know I mean? So obviously, imagine that this is a special version of Linux, but whereas this is the common version of Linux. The big deal. The big deal is that if you want to work with Raspberry Pi, then every device working with Raspberry Pi will have to be also compatible with this version of Linux or with Raspbian. If you're running a software program, then you'll have to make it compatible with this Raspbian version. Whereas here, if you're writing anything Linux-based, anything, it will automatically work with BeagleBone because you don't need to make a special version of it because Ubuntu is used throughout every Linux system out there. So therefore, uh, therefore, uh, if your device is compatible with it, then it will automatically be compatible with BeagleBone. But if you have a system that runs on uh, Linux in general, you still have to make it compatible with this Linux, which would, could be a little bit more work. Another difference between them is that uh, Raspberry Pi is less stable and less um, versatile compared to BeagleBone. BeagleBone is more reliable, more uh, safe compared to Raspberry Pi. You might be thinking, sir, what do you mean by safe? What do you mean versatile? Are we, we going to be in trouble? Are we going to explode? No. But you are, you are actually more prone to having problems with the Raspberry Pi. If you're going to work with the Raspberry Pi in the future, you will know what I'm talking about. Uh, then, of course, all of these features are not for free. They actually come at a cost. Um, of course, uh, essentially, uh, obviously, uh, these extra features come at a price. I, I told you earlier that the Raspberry Pi, on average, is about 300 to 200 ringgit, maybe 100 if you find a cheap one. The bigger one is about 600 to 800 ringgit, or maybe sometimes 900 ringgit per piece. So once again, the more features you have in your device, the more cost it will become. 
So that's why you would see why we don't have, we don't use Beacon Bone in our class this semester, it's because of the cost. If it was up to me or if I had enough funding, I would have definitely went for Beacon Bone. Then again, uh, another reason why, another advantage of Raspberry Pi versus Beacon Bone, and this is not the same slides, I'm going to add it right now. Uh, insert. Where is the insert? It's not here. Okay, copy. Okay, difficult to have. Okay, I'm gonna write it down somewhere here. So basically, the another advantage of Raspberry Pi or over uh, BeagleBone is the fact that availability of libraries. See, RPI, which is Raspberry Pi. Okay, Raspberry Pi has a lot more libraries for it support. What does that mean, support? Availability of libraries, online resources, uh, tutorials, training, etc. Why? Because it came first. Because it came first. Uh, See, uh, because Raspberry Pi came years before BeagleBone, it already was ahead of it, ahead in the race. So there's plenty of resources online for tutorials, libraries, training, and content, and also hardware available. So it's definitely, uh, because of this, it's far more advantageous, especially for beginners, to work with Raspberry Pi rather than BeagleBone. On the other hand, working with BeagleBone, you also have resources online, but not as, as available as, as Raspberry Pi. Uh, but definitely, once you work with Raspberry Pi and you are comfortable with it, then I would recommend that you go for BeagleBone. Also, if you were working for on a production device, not on a training device, if you're working on a real project, you might want to go for BeagleBone, not for Raspberry Pi because of this. Because you want your project to be more reliable, you would want a reliable device. You don't want to have a problem after, let's say, a couple of months in operation. So definitely you would need this to have. There are other advantages and differences. I would suggest that you go through those yourself online. Okay, so uh, what else we have here today? We also have, um, we talked about this, yes. One more comparison. Actually, there's more comparison. Uh, uh, you could actually build Arduino IoT system or Raspberry Pi IoT system. So what is the difference between them? There are actually differences between them. So let's take a look at those right now. In the Raspberry Pi IoT system, it consumes more power. Once again, if you remember in the agriculture example earlier, I told you you might need 1,000 devices. If every one of these devices consumes more power, then you're going to have a very huge electrical bill. But if you have, if you're using Arduino devices and they're using minimal power, then your power consumption will be a lot less. Remember, we said that you could use solar power. Where solar power works fine, but then if if you in the beginning you need less power, then the amount of solar power infrastructure will be a lot less as well. So that's one issue that power consumption in Raspberry Pi is definitely smaller, uh, bigger. Another reason why also you need more power is because it's a full computer on chip. It has a lot more processing required. Whereas the controller is just a simple task, single task, so it needs less power. Okay, connectivity, we just talked about this. Uh, Raspberry Pi is already built in with its own connectivity modules, so it doesn't need extra hardware, but then the Arduino needs more hardware or extra hardware. If you look online for Arduino-based IoT system, you will notice that they will have a separate network hardware separate network hardware spot, and so on and so forth. Sensor connectivity. Uh, the Raspberry Pi accepts only digital sensors. Um, and also, it only has eight input and output pins. I-O means input output. Uh, the pins are the individual spots where you can connect the sensors. And they're all digital. You, can use, uh, you cannot use analog sensors. If you have to use analog sensors, you have to put a converter. But in Arduino, or at least the version of Arduino that we have so far, you have, first of all, 
a lot more pins. You have 14 digital pins plus six analog pins, meaning you can actually work with analog sensors. So what's the advantage of analog and digital sensors? That's a discussion for another day. We will discuss that later um, on the pros and cons of using digital and analog. But for now, let's just say that sometimes you would need analog and sometimes you would need digital. There is a fun, this pros and cons between them. So that's why I'm suggesting you go and go and read about what is the difference or the advantage of digital sensors versus analog sensors. There's advantages and disadvantages on both sides. Now, uh, the Raspberry Pi, what about the programming language? Well, the, the Arduino was written or can be used only for C and C++. This is the primary use of it. And uh, the Raspberry Pi essentially can, because it's a computer on chip, it can use with virtually any language. But for some reason, the most primarily used or the most commonly used is Python. So for our discussion for this semester, that's why we're learning Python, so that you can be familiar with Raspberry Pi when the time comes. And we're learning C because of Arduino. And responsiveness is the last one, uh, the last one on this slide. Uh, the responsiveness of the Raspberry Pi, because it's complexity, it's marginal. When I when we say slower, we are not talking about minutes here. We're not even seconds. We're talking about microseconds. You might be thinking microseconds is very, very small amount of time. It could be for you and me, but for electrical mechanical system or for some systems, microseconds delay could be a problem. So if your system requires a near or real time operations, then micro systems delays could be a problem. But if you're talking about a non real time or if you allow you have no problem with delays, then you, you might as well uh, go for it. So it depends on your operations, whether you need instant operations or you need or oh, you have a we have a, some delays in that. Uh, this one I will not talk about right now. I will talk about next week because next week we will begin a programming. So the first slide I'm going to go for, which is going to be this one right here. Uh, also this because it involves programming, and also this, which means we only have one slide to finish, which is right now uh, a perfect timing. This last slide, which is going to be Arduino Ono combination. Uh, what does that mean? You see, we talked about Arduino, we talked about Raspberry Pi, and we talked about uh, BeagleBone, but actually you could combine them into an individual system. Now, I'm going to show you a real example right now, a real life example to this, and that would be from Bot. Okay, so this is, I'm going to show you the video right now, or it already has a video. Close it. FarmBot is, a, a, is a, a, another example of uh, a, a robot that is connected to the cloud, or IoT-based robot. It's, um, it's a robot that does backyard farming, and it actually works by doing the job. In, uh, let's uh, watch the full video. Let's close the ad. Can we go for a screen? I don't know, you can come and check it out yourself. It's simply farm, F-A-R-M, dot, bot. Oh, they changed their URL. Last time it was farm, bot, one word, dot, I-O, but it looks like they changed the URL to farm, dot, bot. But anyway, uh, this is essentially is a, a robotic uh, agriculture robot. Uh, yeah, it's an agriculture robot, a backyard agriculture robot. Actually, it's a Cartesian robot. If you yeah, it, right here. It's a robot that does farming on its own in the backyard. It does watering, seeding, picking, and monitoring all in real time. And then you can actually watch the data or the information of the. You, you can view what's going on with the with the with the with the with your backyard in real time using your app. Now, what's lovely about this thing is actually is actually open source, meaning you can actually go to the website. And it's 100% open source, meaning you can actually download the information yourself and build it yourself, 100% free. You, you may need to purchase, um, if you know how to build these individual components you're looking at right now, go ahead. 
But if you want to buy those ready-made from the supplier, from them, from those guys, you can, you can order them. But if you have the capability to build it yourself, by all means, go ahead. And do it. In fact, you can actually go and see the design, uh, the hardware, the, the software, it all. The, you can actually get, you can download the program from GitHub and use it directly. No problem. But what I want to show you right now is uh, hardware showcase. Uh, electronics, yeah, right here. Let's take a look at the, uh, the video of the electronics. You can see it from here. And if I, the specs. Oh, yeah, here we are. This is my favorite part. This right here is the electronics. You can right here see that this is a Raspberry Pi. And this actually is a motor drive driver. It's a motor driver board. Basically, every one of these is a motor and it has its own driver. And these are also. Uh, hubs for other things. But I think there is something else missing from here. And uh, yeah, that's the Raspberry Pi. Where is the Arduino? Oh, they updated the system. Yeah, I think so. I think they updated their system. Because last time, this used to be a Raspberry Pi plus Arduino system. But it looks like they changed to a different board altogether. Instead of using Arduino, they use another so unfortunately, this lovely example is no longer a side example. Let's go here. I think this is the last thing we did last, so last three times. Plus, yeah, Arduino. And you will see plenty. Uh, yeah, quite successful Raspberry and Arduino. Let's take a look at this. And you can actually see plenty of examples where K5, I can see. And then you can see plenty of examples where you have a Raspberry Pi board plus an Arduino board working together in the unison. So this is obviously the Raspberry Pi. You can see the Raspberry Pi on the very. Where is the rest of it? And then you have the Uno. Uh, this. Where is the actual list? Six successful. Oh, it's a video. It's not a post. Okay, so let's see other examples. No, wait. No, this is just Raspberry Pi. Yeah, see this? Another example. And you can see uh, more examples of Raspberry Pi plus the Arduino system altogether. And if you're wondering why then would you need to connect a Raspberry Pi and an Arduino together? Because remember that the Arduino is just a controller and chip, and it needs a computer to work with something. You remember, if you, if you ever worked with an Arduino before, you know that you have to plug it into a laptop or a computer to work with it. Is that right? Well, we know that the Raspberry Pi is a computer. Remember, it's a computer on chip, right? So then you can take, instead of hooking up your Arduino to a laptop, you can hook it up to a Raspberry Pi, which is a computer. And also, if you don't like Arduino, Raspberry Pi, you can exchange it for a black, the Beagle Bone Black or BBB. Actually, it's the same idea. The BBB is also a computer on chip, so you can link it up to that and it that way. So linking the Arduino device to a bigger one blank solves or resolves a number of Arduino weaknesses. In fact, combining the Arduino on a Raspberry Pi or bigger one black resolves a number of Arduino weaknesses and open up opportunities. You see, the Raspberry Pi or the bigger one design can work as a cost-effective IoT gateway, or in other words, uh, internet hotspot, as you might already know it. Because the, the, both the Raspberry Pi and the bigger one they already have network capability. So rather than buying a network device to your Arduino, just link it up to the Raspberry Pi. Um, you might be thinking, so uh, it's expensive. Yeah, it definitely is expensive. Um, the network device for the Arduino could be worth 10 ringgit. Um, but what if you already, already have it in-house? Uh, of course, if you want to buy, and you have the option to buy a network card or a Raspberry Pi, of course, buy the network card. But if, if it's already available to you for free, so why buy it? Or, and it's not just the only reason. And you can also, the, the Raspberry Pi and the BBB can also exchange as a computer for your other device, allowing you more than complex operations. And also, we can then get the best of it. You can get a lot of speed, you can get a faster processor speed from the Arduino. <laughs> Complex operation in wireless connectivity, so on and so forth. So this is the reason why or the benefit of combining these two. Yeah. 
I think it's past our time already. It's six o'clock. Yes, it's already right. You can leave if you want. Uh, yes. Anyway, it's already uh, three hours and it's already six o'clock, so it's time already. And uh, thank you very much for joining. And uh, I'll see you in our next class next week. And I'll see you in our next session. Thank you very much, uh, guys. And I'll see you uh, in our next session. Don't forget the assignments and don't forget the group work. Take care.